Hey, what's going on? We're back yet again. Now we're going to get into visions, the last of the senses we're going to cover in this particular unit, largely because it's the most complex, has the most parts, and has the most involved uh, structures, and believe it or not, it's the one we rely on the most as a human. So let's go ahead and dive right into here. I did have two videos down here at the bottom originally for you guys, but both of them were the LASIK videos that I assigned during... <clears throat> your senses lab or your your actual lab that you did for visual visual tests and demonstrations so um let's just move on so just some introductory information about your sense of sight but it is the most relied upon sense of sense by human beings it is also the ones it is the one that um if we do not have our homeostasis is drastically interrupted if we go literally from being a predator species to most likely being the prey species. Humans can see at about almost 10 million colors. Now that might seem like a lot, which really and truly it is, but there are other animals that can see more colors than us. I always love comparing this to dogs. Um, everybody thinks dogs are so smart, but believe it or not, the sense of smell is the one sense that dogs rely upon the most to manipulate their environment. Um, our human eyes allow us to see three-dimensionally and have depth perception. Believe it or not, not all, not all animals in this world actually have the ability to see three-dimensionally and have depth perception. <clears throat> when I was talking about comparing human vision to, to that of a canine, this would be the human color spectrum. So we see basically Roy G. Biv, but we see all the shading and in between colors. What I find is extremely interesting about a dog or a canine species is they see a lot on the yellow end of the spectrum, and then they have the blue down to the violet end of the spectrum, but they don't see those purples. What is amazing to me is, according to this, canines don't see red. So what actually happens is, let's say you had a dog that you said, hey, uh, you know, go get your red ball, go get that red ball. Well, the thing about that is, is that dog isn't actually seeing red. He's just seeing that ball as the one that you reference as the red ball. So he's not really actually seeing red. He's just simply seeing that ball in some other shade of color, which I find is extremely interesting. So let's get into the accessory structures of the eye. These are all the things that don't actually apply to vision, but they are what actually help you see. So they're the accessory structures that aid in vision. So you have the eyelids and fancy name called palpebrae. The palpebrae are the skin that acts as the windshield wipers keeping um, your eye lubricated and free of foreign material. You can, this is very easy to see, um, if you leave your eyes open for an extremely long period of time, nice and wide, you can feel them start to get dry and you want to blink, uncontrollably want to blink. But the other thing is, is they keep them free of foreign material. So if you ever get something in your eye, you ever notice that you unconsciously just blink and blink and blink and blink and blink and blink, and blink uh, until that becomes free. Um, you have two, believe it or not, you have an upper palpebrae and a lower palpebrae and they attach at two points. You have the medial canthus, which is more towards your nose, it's essentially the corners of your eye. And then you have the lateral canthus, which is on the outsides of your eyes. Other accessory structures, you have eyelashes. These prevent material from entering the eye. Some people have longer eyelashes than others. Uh, you have sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are those that actually provide eyelashes with an oil to keep them from sticking together. Can you imagine if when you blinked and your eyelids actually stuck together because they didn't have this lubricating oil being secreted by sebaceous glands at the ends of those eyelashes? You also have what's called the lacrimal caruncle. These are located at the medial canthus and they contain glands that are responsible for eye boogers. Um, these are the things that... Um, essentially collect and secrete things and then at night when your eyes are closed they are trying to push those things out and creates those eye boogers whenever you get um, infections of the can of the lacrimal chronicles you end up with infections called styes your eyelids and your eye have an epithelial layer around them that's called the conjunctiva it's continuous so what happens we have to think about it is it runs along the palpebrae or eyelid and then it connects with the sclera of the eye. The thing about the conjunctiva is they are unbelievably sensitive and subject to irritation and infection. You also have to think about the fact that 
it's the portion of your eye that's constantly being exposed to the external environment. If you want to see the conjunctiva, use where you pull your eyelids down real far and you actually look into that red section. That's the conjunctiva. So it's always being exposed. You're always blinking. So you're always trying to wait, wash away foreign material, bacteria, all of these things. Well, since they're always exposed, um, this is where we get the thing called the um, infection called conjunctivitis, which is also known as pink eye. Um, it's also why it's so contagious is as soon as you touch something and you touch your eye and you blink, you've essentially washed all of that infectious bacteria all over the cover of your eye. And you end up with eyes that look like this. Or in real life, they end up looking like this. So the conjunctiva is going to be pretty much the, the epithelial layer that covers the eye and on the inside of the eyelids you can definitively see why they call it pink eye otherwise known as conjunctivitis. On this slide here I want to point out to you um, particularly the conjunctiva itself. If you look right here and I'll draw on it for you you will notice that the conjunctiva runs along the inside of the eyelid right here and then actually comes back around and covers a portion of the sclera and attaches just below the cornea. And on your upper palpebrae, runs along that outside there and then connects right here. Again, what that results in is a continuous layer from your eyelid to your eye. And when you blink, they get stretched over the top, the top of your eye and your cornea and keeping keeping everything nice and clean. All right. Other things that we have, we have what are called the ap lacrimal apparatus. What they do is they produce, distribute, and remove tears. It's like a, a, a collection of structures that work together for all of this function, and we call that the lacrimal appar apparatus. The things that they do is that they reduce friction between the eye, it keeps it clean, it provides nutrients and oxygen to the conjunctiva. Um, one of the things in that lacrimal apparatus is going to be the lacrimal gland. This is the actual gland, each eye has one, that secretes tears for the eyelids to spread all over the, all over the cover of the eye. Um, something that's very interesting about tears is they actually have an enzyme in them, a protein, that is designed to attack bacteria and other infectious material. So on top of tears being a lubricating fluid, it actually works as an antibacterial uh, substance because of the enzyme within it. There are lacrimal pores or canals. These are in the medial canthus of your eye, and what they do is they collect tears after the eyelids sweep across and filter them into those tears into the nasal lacrimal duct. The nasal lacrimal duct is in fact connects the eyes to the nasal cavity. So your eyes have a direct passageway to your nasal cavity. Here's what's really crazy. My youngest son Jude, he actually was born when you're born, you have a membrane that essentially blocks that nasal lacrimal duct. So your tears and everything don't actually run down into uh, the into the lacrimal pores or canals and then run into the lacrimal duct. When you're born, that membrane breaks. Well, my son Jude, in both of his eyes, um, and all the way up until the age of one, the membranes never broke and they maintained there. So he constantly looked like he had tears running down his face. Um, so when he turned one years old, they actually, we went to Children's Hospital, we took him in, and they put him under for surgery and we're talking like 15 minutes of surgery put him under peeled back his eyes stuck a probe down through the lacrimal pore and into the canal and broke that membrane that runs to the nasal lacrimal duct and no longer did he have crazy amounts of tears running down his eyes or run down his face or in the morning he didn't collect massive gigantic eye boogers so, here's my question then. If all of these things are part of the, uh, the lacrimal apparatus, you have the lacrimal gland, the lacrimal pores and canals, which connect to the lineage of the lacrimal duct, when we cry, why does it seem like our nose is running? Well, if you really think about this, when you cry, you have an overproduction of tears. And I made you read that article about why humans cry, so we're not going to get into it. But if you have an overproduction of tears, 
you blink regularly, some of those tears run down your face. But also there's an over there's a large amount of them that are running into the lacrimal pores and lacrimal canals and into the nasal lacrimal duct which connects to your nose. So really and truly when you cry, a good portion of what you would consider the snot running out of your nose when you cry is believe it or not, part of that is in fact tears possibly. Um, so other uh, accessory structures, you have what are called the extrinsic eye muscles. You also have intrinsic eye muscles, but we're going to solely talk about right now the extrinsic eye muscles. Extrinsic eye muscles are those that are going to control the movements of your eyes. And, and when we were, did the cow eye dissection, I pointed out to you guys that um, cow eyes have the ability to move up, down, left, and right, but they don't have the ability to rotate or roll their eyes but humans do. So we actually have a structures that are more associated with eye movement than that of a cow. I put these pictures up here so you can see what tears look like. It's really sad stuff. I also brought this picture up because this is my oldest son, Owen, when he was one years old. Love the doctor. Went to the doctor. and Look how happy he looks. He's got a smile on his face. There's a big basket of toys here. Well, if you don't already know this, when you go to the doctor at one years old, you get about 6,000 shots. Not in one leg, but both legs. So, uh, he was all happy. He's having a good time at the doctor's office. He's walking around, and this was the result of the shots. Um, why do humans cry? Obviously pain. This was uh, one of the best times of being a father. One, um, <laughs> for some reason I laughed, even though my son was in an extreme amount of pain. Um, but I just thought it was crazy how fast he can go from this emotion to this emotion. All right, so we've gone over some of the accessory structures of the eye, so let's just get into them right now. Boom, boom, boom. Let's start labeling a diagram. So first off, foremost, you have the eyelashes. If you get eyelashes wrong on your test, there's a solid chance I'll just toss you right out of the class. Nah, that's a joke, but please don't get eyelashes wrong. Okay, you have the palpebrae. On your test, you'll be asked to label them as palpebrae. Keep in mind, you have two. You have an upper and a lower palpebrae. That's your top eyelid and your bottom eyelid. You also have the lacrimal canal. There you have two lacrimal canals. The lacrimal canals run to the nasolacrimal duct. Okay, Part of that is the lacrimal sac. So essentially, the canals run into a sac, which then runs directly down into the nasolacrimal duct. You also have what is called the lacrimal caruncle. You see that red looking conjunctiva looking material? It's the corner collection and it has some glands in there that those are the responsible for the eye boogers. You also have, uh, well yeah, like I said, another lacrimal sac. You have the lacrimal pores. The lacrimal pores are the openings to the lacrimal canals. So your tears get secreted by the glands onto your eye where they wash across the eye in this direction when you blink and then the tears get uh, funneled into the pores which run into the canals which run into the lacrimal sac and down through the nasal lacrimal duct you also have and these aren't accessory structures but i figured it would be worthwhile we just kind of throw these in you have the iris which is the colored portion of the eye you have the sclera which is the white of your eye you also have the pupil, which is the hole in the iris. And there's the lacrimal gland that creates tears and secretes them onto the eyes. And then just to review, you have the canthus. Remember, the lateral canthus and the medial canthus are the two connections of the upper and lower palpebrae. Let's now go through our extrinsic eye muscles. So for extrinsic eye muscles, they all end in the exact same name and their location is based on their name. So the superior rectus is on the superior side of the eyeball and when it contracts, it pulls the eye upward. You also have the superior oblique. Now here's what's crazy, when, you, when this contracts, it actually pulls the eye downward. You have to imagine that this muscle here connects and then also connects down in this region here. So when it contracts, it pulls or shortens the muscle and it yanks the eyeball down in this direction. You also have the medial rectus. The medial rectus is going to be the one that's closest to your nose because that's a medial portion of your face. When this one contracts, it boom, it pulls your eyes inward, making you have the cross-eyed look. You also have the inferior rectus, which is going to, when it contracts, pulls your eye down. 
You have the inferior oblique. When it contracts, it pulls your eye up and outward. And then you have the lateral rectus, which pulls your eye towards the outside corners. So you can actually, for your eye movements, you can have a combination of these contracting at the same time, which produces complex eye movements like rolling your eyes, looking down into the corner of your eyes, uh, going cross-eyed. Um, I've never seen anybody that has this ability, but the ability to make one eye look up and the other look down, that would be awesome. But um, they, all the combinations together create complex movements of the eye. So that's where we're going to stop for this part with the accessory structures and everything like that. If you have any questions, you just let me know.